and I'm here with my old friend Dave Bish. So, Dave, I can't remember, but where exactly did we meet? Uh, yeah, I was trying to think about that. Um, yeah, I stayed at your house once, you stayed at mine once. So we definitely oh, met right. in those kind of contexts. Back in the days where I used to do what I used to write stuff online, I suppose, and you did, and we interacted a bit, I guess, in that kind of world a decade or more ago, something like that, I think. Yeah, something like um, that, isn't it? Yeah, wasn't it something to do with you and UCCF or something? Was that how we met? I can't remember now. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I was I was up in your neighbourhood at some point. I think it was probably the last time I saw you, but that was definitely yeah. well over ten years ago. So, uh, oh, there you go. So you and I haven't really chatted still for here. a while, and then we just no. chatted just quite recently, didn't we? Just just this last week, we reconnected. Really, although I have been following you a little bit online, and I think you've been following me a bit online as well. So what happened this yeah, last week? To cross what, what happened in this last uh, week or so? Well, yeah, well, I guess, too, I mean, you started posting stuff about divorce and uh, on all kinds of perspectives. And uh, I'm an associate pastor of a church and preaching my way through Mark's gospel. And my next text was um, Mark 10, where Jesus talks about divorce. And so, um, you know, I'm picking up commentaries and various other resources. And you start posting stuff and um, you started giving me lots of the things I needed to have a look at. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess that's how I landed back so on what your you're blog. saying is um, somebody, um, somebody arranged me to help you with your preparation by the sounds of it. <laughs> Seems like it, yeah. Yeah, oh, so much appreciated on that. So. Uh, that's cool. So, I mean, have you had any personal experience of divorce yourself, Dave, or uh, in any of those that are around you at all? So not personally. Um, I've been married for a fairly long time now, I guess. Um, there have been people in my wider family um, where um, I guess I've yeah experienced divorce from a slight distance, not a, not a closest closest in family, but um, in in the kind of wider family. Um, and I guess like ultimately, I I live in the UK and and divorce is increasingly common, um, mm. and so among friends um, and certainly. I think I was very conscious coming to um, to preach on the subject that as I look out at my church family, um, there are people who are divorced, who have been, uh, some of whom have remarried, some haven't, and, and beyond, beyond, beyond that, and that's just ones I know about, um, and then beyond that, there are lots of families where inevitably there are stories of divorce um, as part of people's um, own family um, or their friends. So it, it feels like it's just a very normal part of the experience of living in this country at, at the present. Yeah, I mean, do you did you always feel that way, or or, or does that kind of gradually come to your attendance? Because I know for me, um, until relatively recently, it wasn't really something I had had much to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think when I looked at some of the kind of stats, and I, I looked at it kind of on the numerical level, conscious that it's a this is personal, not just numbers. Um, I think. I knew that it was a growing phenomenon, reality uh, in our society. Um, I think certainly growing up, only one family member was kind of the person I would have known who was uh, divorced. Mm. And I think having come from, um, I guess, a family where there were some long lasting marriages, um, for which I'm very thankful, I think I picked up a sense of the wrongness of divorce. It felt mm. wrong and jarring and uncomfortable. Um, and I guess the kind of, as a child growing up with married parents, thinking, I don't want that to be part of my family story. Um, I don't want to have to go through the pain that I've seen in other yeah. people's situations. Um, so, yeah, I guess kind of conscious of, of the reality of it in that way, but um, perhaps not as much personally as, yeah. as yeah. I think about now, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I guess depending on the sort of church we're in, if we are Christians in a church, you know, it's still the case sometimes that you know you, you might you right. might be you might kind of escape it being too up close and personal with you. I mean, it, it can happen. I mean, I, I've I heard one of the people that wrote to me, uh, and actually, I've, I don't think I've had as many people write to me um, in the aftermath of a blog series in in quite a while, actually, or during uh, in quite a while, probably not since the sort of days when um, where you know the high gone days of blogging when we were all sort of arguing about each other's blogs all over the internet or discussing them, as I should say. But one of the people that wrote back was talking about how they, as um, one of the 
elders, I think it was, of her church had gone through a divorce as an elder. And I thought, gosh, that must have been quite a challenge in many ways. And for many Christians, um, and perhaps some watching this, they might feel like, might be wrong, of course, because people don't always talk about it, but they might feel like they're the only person in their church that is going through this or has gone through this. And so it can feel quite isolating. And I, and I know it did for me. Uh, um, in many ways, in my own personal story, and uh, obviously, I'm not really here to talk too much about that. But I'm mean, talk about it in passing a little bit. But um, yeah, I think one of the huge things about it is just how how it can feel a bit like, as you say, jarring, a bit like it's not this. This, this shouldn't be somehow. We're Christians. We should do better, kind of thing. And and to feel like a failure, I guess. Yeah, and I think like I mean, obviously, the kind of it would seem. I, so one of the stats I drew up. Um, last week in preparing was uh, the Evangelical Alliance did some some research a little while ago, which does suggest that that Evangelical Christians do divorce less than the average population kind of member, um, but actually still about a quarter of cases. So it's in some ways that feels surprisingly high, I think, and um, to think yeah. that many proportion of marriages. And I think when I look at them and think about my church family, I think really a quarter is is that. Is that possible? Is that likely? But but that's that's the research which would suggest that overall that is the case, um, and it's it's just the it's the pain of it, isn't it? And the like the reality of we don't want to think that those happy wedding days ended up in that kind of situation. That something happened that meant that that was, um, yeah, how the story turned out. Um, yeah, and I, obviously I don't know from first hand experience what that's um, like, but I have listened to others. Excuse me if I dog barking in the background. He's just enjoying singing. I don't know how much you can hear via the microphone, but <laughs> can you hear him badly or not too bad? Not especially, no. Okay, that's good. Um, so, yeah, no, I think I think you're right. And I guess stigma, I mean, that's where I jumped on on this. I just felt um, to write a post about, you know, what can we do to reduce the stigma of divorce? Because I suspect that most churches will have in their congregation – perhaps someone who looks like they're single um, and maybe that just looks like they never got married, but perhaps they haven't felt that they can talk to anyone about the experience they had. Or maybe there might be a couple that look like they've been married for 20 years when reality is they've been married for like, say, three or five and they joined the church and didn't feel again that they could talk about it. Um, and or of course, there might be people going through, you know, real trauma in their marriages, you know, desperately clinging on, um, watching their marriage on a, on a life support machine, uh, and thinking it would be terribly unchristian to pull the plug, um, but knowing that perhaps that's what's coming for them. So I guess in all of those circumstances, that's someone who's wrestling with either the prospect of it or the in the here and now or having happened before, but might not feel they can talk about it. And and you, you mentioned about, you know, experience as a pastor with people in your church. Do you think that conversations you've had with people about this has some measure, measure of that stigma evolved, do you think? Yeah, I think there certainly is some of that. Um, I mean, I, I do wonder if there's a kind of twin thing going on. Of, so, I, and I, I said this slightly lightheartedly in my sermon on it of, you know, on one level, do we divorce less because our faith helps us with our marriages? And I kind of hope that some of that's true. Um, but on the other hand, do we divorce less because actually the stigma is that it's just off the table. It just can't be a kind of consideration. Mm. Um, and uh and I suspect that's probably at least at least as true as well. Um, that it's mm -hmm. just no, that can't be a possibility. And I know I've thought that way. And I obviously I hope that turns out to be the case that it that yeah. there would be no reason for that to happen. Um, but it does disturb me to think actually if we if if we've concluded that we're not making room for for what Jesus says that that hard heartedness that things going wrong for a, a number of different reasons might be why that um, ends up being. Um, yeah, how things turn out and if we don't feel like we can talk about something then even the we don't face up to it do we, we don't um, be honest about it. i mean i'm interested that you've got so much feedback having written on this because i don't think i've yeah. had as much interaction after preaching as i've had on this subject That's really interesting. That's um, really interesting. Of people i think partly encouraged that we just talked about something that we don't normally yeah. talk about um partly going yeah this is in my back family background this is my life um I mean, I, as I say, I knew of some situations or others I now know about that I didn't know about a week ago. That's interesting, isn't it? Come and said, actually, yeah, this is part of our story, and and we're we're quite a mobile church, quite a transient church, um, and so I think you often you're seeing just the recent snapshot of people's life story. Yeah. 
Um, and you're not prying into what's come before, and it's probably not the first thing someone announces um, as they're introducing yeah. themselves either. <laughs> no, um, quite, yeah. It's like, oh, but hello, they, but that is part of people's story. And, you know, it doesn't quite like happen like that, does it? Yeah, and I, just, I, I guess, and I don't, maybe you'd have some insight on it, I suspect that in plenty of cases, divorce doesn't, at least in part for one person, mean moving somewhere else. And so yeah. you're not, not, not necessarily seeing the aftermath of that in the actual situation um yeah and so yeah no, all I think we see right. is an unmarried person or a remarried person who we just think is married um yeah. and not knowing and of course that's true for in loads of different directions for lots of people isn't it like we we don't advertise our full backstory a lot of the time and and so much of that is messy for so many of us in so many different ways but we go oh no we all look everything's fine <laughs> um we must yeah. get to some sort of typical stereotype of, of what life is and you know yeah some people probably do <laughs> um but that's not everybody's situation and we're a whole lot more messy and broken and hurt than we perhaps give away when we meet one another yeah no i think you're right and i think that sort of perfect christian type of image is part of the problem you know that you can feel as if as much as we talk about gospel and grace and forgiveness and the god of second third fourth fifth chances there is a sort of underlying kind of pressure that we feel sometimes from outside but also from just inside us to somehow live up to expectations and that our lives should live up to that expectation and um yeah the, the sort of the perfect image of the perfect christian and um, the reality is, of course, is, as you said yourself, many of us are suffering quietly. So it is quite interesting. And I guess to any pastors watching this, you know, the encouragement would be to, to perhaps speak about it and to perhaps do a sermon about it and to perhaps, you know, create an environment where people can feel that they're able uh, to talk about it without feeling that they're going to be judged or, 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 or labelled, of course. And we'll come on to a little bit more about what to say about it in, in a moment. But I guess just from my own perspective, for sure, um, the way I started my first article on this was just with this notion that never think about it. That, you know, I thought to myself, the moment you ever even think about it or mention it um, in your marriage is, is the moment that your marriage is a failure. And I think I've I've heard Christian teaching like that a little bit. That you know, It's almost like a magic thing. You know, if you let the word divorce come out of your mouth in a discussion or an argument, or you let the thought come into your mind that it could even be a possibility that somehow you're immediately on on a track to, to failure, as it were. And so, you know, there's, there was certainly a number of years in my life where, you know, this was something that, you know, I, I just couldn't bear to think about, couldn't bear to imagine, you know, what, what, what was going to happen. And again, I don't want to get too much into my story, but there was certainly a lot of pain there and a lot of pain as it actually happened of feeling different, you know, and feeling like a failure, uh, feeling like it was all my fault. And of course, I guess the truth is it's rarely the case that it's all one person's fault. Um, and actually perhaps we shouldn't be thinking in terms of fault or blame in that sort of way at all sometimes, you know? I mean, it's going to vary case to case, isn't it? And everyone's situation is different. Um, but it, I think yeah, it does strike me as if it's, I mean, anywhere where there's a taboo subject, just, we're probably asking for trouble, aren't we? That would, if we don't talk about things. And you know, I was conscious. I so we're a very transient church. We're quite a young church. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm I'm speaking to the particularly the people who are in the room, not much with a wider eye than that. I've got out the corner of my eye a newlywed couple want strip first Sunday back off the honeymoon this is what they're hearing um, you know I've got couples I know are remarried um, after divorce I've got those who've been divorced and have chosen not to remarry um, I've got a whole lot of stories I'm not aware of um, I've got lots of young couples who are bright eyed and I hope enjoying the early part of married life um, and it, it really struck me that you know we do preparation for people getting married and I guess a lot of churches would do that I'm not sure we talk a lot about divorce within that. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't want it to be the major subject. That would be a no, little no, bit sure. strange. Um, but actually, I, I think there's a, there's a safety in going, like, this, we always, we want this to work. Of course we do. Yeah. And when we make till death, let's be part type vows. Like, we're hopeful and we're optimistic and we're, we're hoping that that is how this marriage goes. But, like, the reality is, it does, clearly it doesn't always go that way that's not everybody's story yeah um and as soon as you go well it doesn't matter what happens that's out of the question like divorce just that's never a possibility i 
I fear that we set people up for not being able to face up to like yeah. difficulties and realities that that may not land in their life, that may not be part of their story, but might be. Um, and why would we presume we wouldn't do that? In, we try not to do that in other areas of life. We, go, we, you know, we take sin seriously. We take the mess and brokenness of life seriously. Well, why do we not do that when we're thinking about marriage? That like this yeah. is this is not the kind of exempt area where no, this could never happen. Um, mm -hmm. And it's no, awkward I think that's, and it's that's a really good point. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I guess one of the issues um, there is that. You can make things worse, I think, you know, and this is something something I've spoken to, you know, a few people about who've who've been through the same sort of thing as a Christian, that um that sort of almost tabooness of even talking about it, thinking about it, focus it helps you feel so alone, I think, as well. So that's the other thing. It means you feel you can't talk, you can't get help, or when you do get help, you're frightened that the person is gonna be disappointed in you or or they're going to look down their nose at you or whatever. But it also I think can trap people in a marriage that you know, where it actually does feel like it's already dead, you know, um, like their marriage is on life support and someone needs to pull the plug, but they don't have the courage to do so um, and feel like that that would be, you know, almost the unforgivable sin to do so. And and I just wonder, because I've heard some, some pretty, you know, uh, toe-curling stories about divorces being particularly um, angry and, uh, uh, you know, and unpleasant, you know, whether... Maybe in some situations there's an optimal time, and perhaps you know hanging on can make can make things worse. Um, I came across an interesting quote, which I, I which um, didn't come from Christian. Actually, it came from a I think it's from a Turkish playwright, and he just said that divorce is like a fire exit, and um, you know if if there's no way out of the burning building, then everyone inside is going to burn. And I think I do wonder that there might be some some people even listening to this who who feel so enslaved. I mean, it's interesting, the word is enslaved is used around 27 in one of the key verses about divorce in the Bible. And, you know, it talks about that feeling of of being trapped, of, of being enslaved, and, you know, perhaps in a marriage that actually the other person might have really essentially destroyed already, but you feel that, that, that there's no way out. And I think that's certainly something for anyone here. And, and of course, we're not trying to actually advocate or encourage divorce here, are we? And we're not trying to say that that's the solution to every troubled marriage, because God does believe in, you know, reconciliation and restoration and new starts for people and for their marriages. So I guess it's going to be hard to get the balance right moving forwards. We don't want to become, you know, no fault divorce people. Let's just go for it and move on to the next person kind of thing. So I, any thoughts about that as a wise pastor um, dish? A dish, I just call you dish, Dave Fish. Sorry, I hope I'm wise. I want to be more wise. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're like Christians are inherently hopeful people, aren't we? Mm. Um, like, so we want things to we want to believe things can be mended. Um, and we have a vision that says eternally, like far more can be mended than we know it can be made right, and it and all things will be made new. Um, although actually, of course, marriage won't be part of eternity yeah. in that sort of sense. Um, but I think the danger then is we think yeah there must always be a way to fix it now um and I, I think sometimes the building's burning and no one goes to their wedding day going let's set this on fire at some point and right. let's try and burn this house down but sometimes that happens and and it's really tragic when it happens um um i mean i think lots of what you posted on this is just very helpful that kind of tim keller's thing wasn't it about a divorce being like amputation um mm. and and the ending of a marriage is is terrible in any circumstance i i mean i was reflecting just this afternoon on what i said and um i think i said something like ideally marriages end with funerals yeah um rather than in fourth courts and and of course like when you're saying ideally a funeral that you're already acknowledging the end of a marriage in any scenario then is a really horrible grievous thing because a funeral is not yes. a nice thing and and death it's isn't how things ideally meant to a be. funeral <laughs> Like, we so you're like, this, we're already in this kind of crazy, yeah. like, this will be tragic at any point. Um, but sometimes it's not going to be that. Sometimes things are so broken um, that there isn't any restoring it in the here and now. And there can be forgiveness, um, and both for the wrong wrongdoer and, and, and the person who's been hurt can, can, um, can wreck it. So, but that still doesn't necessarily mean everything can be fixed in the here and now. And that's true in lots of stuff. Like I think across the board of Christian discipleship, sometimes we trash things so badly mm. that they can't be fixed now. Um, and some things can be, and I'm 
believe in healing and believe in lots of miraculous restoration and that's definitely true too but it can't always be and and i think we sometimes draw too much of the future into the present in that sense and go oh yeah there's always it can always be sorted out and you think well sometimes it can um and we want that of course you'd want you're right to want that to happen but there are situations where they just it can't and sure. and there can be glorious eternal healing and and the wrongdoer can be forgiven and can still be a Christian and all of that's still absolutely possible. But we can also trash things in the present in a way that's just not in this lifetime repairable. And I think we need to have that kind of sense of reality that that's, that is how sometimes things go. And we don't set out to do that and we wouldn't want that to be the outcome. But sometimes it gets to that. And, uh, you know, and there's a whole other thing of how do we support people in married life to try and avoid getting to that sort of situation um and i get here we're more talking about once it's got to that kind of situation aren't we and, yeah yeah of course yeah yeah um, so yeah but, i mean yeah i think you're right i think the the thing here as well isn't it is that i mean we talk about it being trashed and oh my goodness <laughs> talking about being trashed the weather's just changed i'm gonna move inside <laughs> i'm getting wet that's so funny uh, just one second as we do that but I think sometimes people can feel like um, either it's all their fault um, or it's all the other person's fault. Um, there's a lot of fault blame finding, which isn't necessarily sometimes helpful. But having said that, you know, sometimes it isn't, you know, you haven't necessarily done anything to create the divorce. And it can be the situation that the divorce is done to you rather than you doing it. And I think a lot of Christian teaching always seems to assume that it's it's both of you, uh, which it isn't always, you know. I mean, sometimes it is, uh, often perhaps it is. And I guess none of us are a perfect husband or a perfect wife, so there'll always be something that we've done that has perhaps not been ideal. But do, do you see what I mean? This whole thing of feeling somehow that you failed. Yeah, and that's not necessarily the case, is it? And you, you may have done everything right um, or, you know, within the bounds of, yeah, as you say, normal we're not perfect people but um yeah and i think i felt very conscious of of people like that listening um where and you know in some of those situations if they're still in the mid middle of the mess of of a broken down marriage that i've potentially got both of those people sat in front of me next to each other um yeah. who might need to hear something slightly different um in yeah. the kind of the reality of a pastoral kind of interaction in preaching but um but yeah, I mean, it does seem to me that provision is made, and we're getting to some of the answers, I guess. But yeah. for all those who have been wronged, for whom it's it's not their fault, um, it wasn't them that caused it. If if you can pull apart the pieces and work out who caused what anyway, which I, I would accept, you can't always do that, and it wouldn't necessarily be very fruitful to do either. Um, but the particularly, um, we know the Lord is is concerned for those who are vulnerable, who are harmed, yeah. who um the stuff that happens for whatever reason and in whatever way leaves them exposed and caught in a difficult situation um and it's those kind of people who flock to jesus um yeah. and who who saw that he was someone who could offer them the grace that and help that they needed um and surely it's the church's job and my job as a pastor to be providing and presenting jesus in that kind of way to those who um are in need of that care um yeah. however they got to wherever they are in a sense it doesn't hugely matter um but to know yeah, that and, jesus is there so. and there has to be grace for the one who has caused the problem as well let's be honest yeah. you know because yeah. it's funny isn't it we often talk about forgiveness and grace but we're also living in a society now where um cancelling is is quite a common thing and so i think you can sometimes feel like rightly or wrongly and sometimes it can be rightly that people like your friends your family your pastor maybe even um every, you know members of your church you can feel as though they know, want nothing to do with you now and that you've been blamed as somehow tarred with some bush and you know maybe you have done something really dramatic or or and well, it's just assumed that you must have done something wrong i mean i i certainly had um people that I know who who are you know you would have to say was the innocent party if you knew the circumstances but then again you know you only know one side of the story often but you know but but it certainly sounds pretty dramatically clear and still you know other people would say to them oh but you must have done something to, to make that 
that person go off and you know go off with someone else or whatever the situation sh sh was you know so it's kind of like that blame culture and um you know cutting people off and division can be, can be really painful and and people and, and i think john piper expressed it rather well when he said that divorce is it's actually often more painful than losing your spouse um to death which might surprise people when they hear that if if but if they haven't gone through it but just you know everything changes you often lose your friends suddenly you're not in that same group of of married friends i mean that's a whole nother story by the way as well about how churches often you tend to have little sort of cliques of married people and the single people can feel left out and so i'm not saying that's how it should be but that's how it often is and suddenly you're not in anymore you know suddenly um everything's changed you know you lose at least often you lose half your family because the people who you've been doing life with are now sort of saying well that you know that one's my biological relative so why are you going to be part of my life uh and you often lose friends and yeah you often people feel they have to move on in order to get a fresh start as well because it can just be you know too painful to be around and i i remember talking to a friend of mine who was who was widowed um you know, during the same time that all this was going on for me, you know, for my divorce. And we, we had long conversations about what was worse, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, for her, and I didn't put this into the blog, actually, but that for her, one of the comforts of, of going through a grieving process is you do have happy memories to look back on. And one of the challenges with a, a divorce is you can feel like the previous 25 years or more of your life just has this huge sort of cloud over it. And if anyone asks you about it, um you know about your life you know it can just be terribly painful actually you know there might be places that you went to that that are now too painful to go to you know there might be uh holidays that you went on you think well i don't really want to go back there um all kinds of things really it can be incredibly painful yeah yeah and i guess you know maybe this is a good transition point really um to say that as you know as churches we need to figure out how we can be better at helping people in that kind of situation and i guess we sort of talked a little bit about the kind of basics of being kind and loving and all the rest of it but if i'm honest one of the crucial issues is what are we saying because if you have a very rigid view of divorce as, as some people do and, and you know we went through a lot of those views both in your sermon and in my series where they say things like well you know divorce might be allowable in some situations but remarriage never is for example that can feel incredibly tough for people who, as I put it, they might have tasted the togetherness of even even bad marriage and not really want to be on their own or, or struggle with being on their own. Um, and yet, you know, we're consigning people sometimes with some traditional views of marriage and remarriage to a lifetime of being alone. And that can that can feel like you've thrown someone onto the onto the the pile or that no ministry opportunities will ever be open to them again because they're perhaps in a denomination or a church that says you can't be divorced and remarried and and be a leader um so have you got any thoughts about that i mean how conscious of you were you of 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 that when you were preparing and thinking about what you're going to say no very much conscious i think and and i think partly knowing that we probably have a range of how that's worked out for people because again because our church being relatively transient um some of those issues have been worked out in other places and then people have moved to us um some have perhaps been worked out more locally um i think i'm always conscious in church life that the church ends up being can end up being doesn't have to be quite family centric um that we end up running programs and support structures for married people and for their children um and there's a probably a right sense in which plenty of energy goes into doing that um, but we've got a significant number of unmarried people for a whole range of reasons the never married widow divorced um and uh and the, so i think one of the challenges for us is we've looked at this so this wasn't the first time anybody at our church in recent time have preached on divorce um, another member of our team did a couple of years ago as we worked through one corinthians um and we made sure there to do we did one message on being unmarried as well and and just addressing different kinds of situations and recognizing that I'm not sure you can say that to be married is the normative default best situation for a believer. Uh, it's a good thing, um, but it's perfectly valid to be in other situations as well. And I guess the challenge for us is to, to run church life in a way that says, yeah, you can be in lots of di these different situations. Um, I think the other thing is that um, 
and I, you know, I took a position on the remarriage stuff in my sermon, having laid out what seemed to me to be the kind of two main positions that someone might come to. Um, I don't think it's overly helpful to be too dogmatic on that. Um, like in a sense, as you support and counsel somebody, you've got to work that through, and they've got to work through um, where they where they stand on that. Um, and I don't want to trample over the person who has concluded for them it wouldn't be right to remarry. Yeah and has embraced the consequences of that but i also don't want to trample over the person who has concluded that remarrying is okay um and yeah i think you can make some case for both as i said in my sermon i i, I think i'm i would stand on the second of those that i think there are grounds for saying you can remarry after a divorce um i don't think i would have said that um not i don't think because i particularly thought it through historically i think i it just grated with me that from where from cultural things really that sure. somehow that probably wasn't appropriate um but i think when you then stop and look at it I, I, it seems and you can i think there's a case for that that's um that makes a lot of sense to me at this point um and uh but it, it's walking through that with people carefully slowly recognizing very much that this is coming out of a painful situation for whatever range of reasons um and these are not things that people are embracing lightly i mean nobody's embracing marriage should be embracing marriage first or second or third or whatever lightly we, you know we say at the wedding ceremony you've got to enter into this seriously and thoughtfully um so so i think it's there's, there's an onus on us to be really careful um with people and with god's word um but not to presume that somebody else has been reckless with the truth or doesn't care about what the lord says just because they happen to have come to a slightly different conclusion on this i that yeah you know, feels unhelpful to trample over somebody's conscience in that really um and i'm yeah, yeah. very conscious i think when you say things publicly you're not having a it's not a private pastoral conversation it's quite hard yeah. to do the nuance and the care of that and i hope i was able to do that to some extent but oh, and, I, yeah I, I recognize the limits of the format no, I think you did. I think you did really well. And I think I think it's interesting because when I was looking at some of the quotes, I was looking at it perhaps from a different angle than someone who's just purely researching a sermon or whatever. Um, but also from what I talked about the tone and the, the the one person that came across as being quite harsh, even though he had a slightly more open view, at least in theory, to uh, to another of the pastors, it felt to me in reading the quote that the tone seemed harsh. Now, I might have been a bit biased because for whatever reason, but that's how it came across. Whereas there was another one which was just quite interesting because I think it, you know, that story reflects a little bit of 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 the struggle and the suffering and the personal nature of it. Where you know John Piper, I mean, it's it's quite well known amongst these circles that he he has a fairly rigid view, at least personally, of this. That he feels that marriage is lifelong, and no matter how it ends, actually, um, you should never remarry. But um, but he was also incredibly compassionate about the struggling that people were talking about through divorce and i found that helpful as i mean he was the one who said it's it's often worse than than losing a spouse um through death which i thought was quite insightful for someone who's never personally been through it um but also when you look at his church situation and the church statement that they made drew up many years ago now actually they chose as a church to be a bit more inclusive than 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 his view and so he was quite willing to accept that there would be people who have different views and even amongst his elders there were some who had different views and so the actual church um policy was different although they don't allow anyone to have any form of you know eldership or deacon deacon type views who've been remarried and um you know his own son uh has gone on record publicly as having gone through a divorce and has also you know mentioned that he's been remarried and there are photos of Piper attending his his wedding online. So I think that's, you know, at least a positive there, that there's clearly an indication of, of someone coming out of this from a kind of gracious approach. But I guess for people like Keller and, and interestingly, Wayne Grudem, um, they've gone a little bit further. And I don't I don't know what you thought of, of, of those arguments. I'm not sure if you caught the Grudem one before your, your sermon or not, because I only found that um, quite late on in the weekend, I think. Yeah, I think I had a chance to see it, but I'd already yeah, I printed my notes at that point, so it didn't particularly it didn't impact. Make it um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to see the different perspectives on that, and and the 
it's it's all this there's interchange isn't there between um like what's god's design what's an ideal world scenario and yeah. this is not this is a fallen broken world um and we live in the middle of that um and yeah i think it's it's one thing to say well this is how things ideally we would be um but, but to acknowledge the, the reality of that i mean i i found Keller's um, reflections really helpful. I mean, I, I, it particularly struck me that I think that's a 1990 sermon. Um, yes. So, so it, which, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is not that long ago, but on the other hand, is quite a long time ago. And and I think culturally feels like a long time ago and that he's taking that kind of tone. And I, I wasn't even a believer in 1990, but my assumption would be that it would have been that would have been an unusual perspective to have taken to be so full of grace on on this at that stage um you know it's not this is not a few years ago reacting to well now it's normal and much more common so therefore let's be gracious it's in a situation where probably i mean certainly in this country at that stage it still would have been quite unusual and to have as many people divorced in in a church context or in society as well um and yet full of grace and i but i think what's shaping that is him going Look, we come as we are. We've got to where we've got to, and the Lord Jesus is full of grace, and and it, it doesn't turn people away. And there is forgiveness. And He did. I mean, I love that language of the worst cases. I mean, it, I, I like it in the sense that experientially we know that we live in. I don't. Want, I'm cautious of labeling other people's scenarios as that's the worst case thing. Yeah. But the stuff that feels in our own experiences that feels most painful, um, most broken, most difficult, most likely to make other people think that we are beyond the pale. Um, those are the things that Jesus specializes in. He he loves yeah. people in that. He's full of grace for people. And like, if there's anything we can say in this world, it, surely it's that in a world where people get cancelled and written off and shamed and all of that, like. Jesus is not like that at all. And, you know, he yeah. he's full of grace and he engages with us at that kind of level. And there's a reason that the, the, the outsiders and the people whose situations seem most difficult were the people who flocked to him in all the gospel accounts because he met people in that kind of moment. And it wasn't shape up and fix up and clean up and pretend it's all fine and then you can come. It's in the depths of it. And... And I don't, I don't know about you, I hope your church experience is like this, but my assumption on a Sunday morning is, like, wow, people made it here. That's just phenomenal. Like, people crawled in the door, dragged themselves in off the past week, and all the struggle and difficulty and brokenness of living in this world as people who are still not fully made new in every way. Mm. Wow, we're here. You know, Jesus says, come all who are weary and burdened and like which of us isn't which of us hasn't found life difficult which of us isn't carrying many many burdens and yet here's jesus who offers us rest um and if the church isn't a place where you can come for rest whatever your story has been whether you were the wrongdoer or the wronged or or, or whatever it's been and whether it's new struggles or old ones or or, or whatever I, I don't know who we are if that's not what we're able to offer people really so um so i think our tone has to be like that and i, I think i've particularly found that with keller i think Gruden's comments seem to reflect the same sort of um tone um but i yeah i think even just some of the comments from piper we don't want to be harsh with this like this is a hard mm. position to take and i think he would acknowledge that um it does it makes it's there's some coherence to it i don't think it's completely um mm. with, like, i don't it's not quite where i've landed um, but I could I see where he's coming from. Yeah, sure. But he's not wielding that against people and beating them with it. Um, and he's uh, as his own personal story. But I don't think just because of that, I, it reflects that he knows that what people are like, and he knows what he's like, and and how hard life can be in lots of different ways. And so our our tone and our posture with our gospel truth is. It's kind of as important as the content of it. I mean, uh, the two things mm. just. Uh, I don't think you can really separate them. Although often I think they seem to jar with each other in ways that aren't helpful. No, that's that's really helpful. And, and Dave, that sort of came across 
really well to you. And I'm conscious that I've taken quite a bit of your time already. I don't want to take too much longer. But just at this point, as a little bit of a kind of almost an advert break, really, um, recommending other resources to people. And I think um, if you go to my website, um, which is Pathios, um, or just Google Asian Warnock, you'll see uh, the, the summary post was called... Um, uh, Christian views or different Christian views of marriage and divorce and in that post I've actually embedded um, Dave's sermon and I commend that to you because sometimes it's good to actually hear the word preached as well as just reading uh, stuff and I, I, I personally found that incredibly encouraging and it was of course interesting to me to hear some of the same quotes I'd found being used uh, and used well and um, with good grace so I would encourage you to have a look at that yeah. and if someone wants to dig into it a little bit more uh, you know, there is a lot of um, quotes on, on my site. Uh, there's the article about stigma, which is where it all began. Um, and, and Dave, I don't know, you know, I should have asked this before, but how would you feel about letting some of your notes be available? Do you have, I don't know what sort of notes you write. Um, do you have like quotes and references and things that maybe we didn't have or um, or, or, is, or your notes just really for your own eyes? Because I know preachers are different about that. So it depends how, how, how you'll post yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, really. I collated, yeah, I collated some stuff. I think, to be honest, you've gathered... Pretty, pretty much comprehensive same, yeah. set of things. There were a few other things I read, but I'm not sure they've added a lot of different material. Yeah. Um, well, to be and, honest, uh, I did weave in some of your stuff as well. Like I think you found a Calvin quote, which was particularly helpful. I've, I've dug that in and put it onto my reformers post. So I, th I tell you what, if there's anything else that you think of that I would think that might be helpful, just let us know and I can I can put it on yeah. there as well. But I think there's quite a lot of material there in that little series that if nothing else will help you sort of think it through. Um, but the other thing I would just really recommend for people um, is something called the Restored Lives course that is one of the many things that Holy Trinity Brompton run. Um, and it kind of comes out uh, a little bit of the alpha stable. So it's a similar approach, really. Um, and they do it online. I mean, you can do them face to face as well in some centres, but it's something quite powerful about going online because if you're the only person in your church, you know, they can't exactly throw on a divorce course just for you. Um, well, they could, I suppose, but it wouldn't, you'd miss out on perhaps one of the strengths of that, which is meeting other people. So you have a little group, there's a short talk, and they talk about all the different aspects of divorce. And it's very relevant for someone who's in the middle of it, very relevant for someone who is in the recent past, but also for someone who for whom it's been years ago, um, because I don't think divorce is ever something you fully move on from. And there may well be sort of wounds and scars that open up even years later. And I've had a few people, you know, write in about that. Um, and there was certainly the course I was on, there was a number of people who who ha hadn't really done much sort of thinking through of it and, and talking through of it, something that they'd suffered with on their own for many, many years, who fa finally were in a group of, of you know, people who'd been through a similar experience and also, you know, some wise, godly um, advice and also some professional advice as well, talking about good ways and bad ways to to go about things uh, during divorce and certainly things about that. So I certainly strongly commend people to look at that, whatever your church background, um, or even if you're not a Christian watching this, uh, that course is designed to be as welcoming to everyone, really, um, from any background. Uh, that starts in May, so you could certainly sign up for that. Is there anything else that you can think of that might be helpful for people watching this? No, I think, I mean, I think that I'm not familiar with that course directly. Um... I've, yeah, use some of their other course materials. I'm sure that's helpful. And I think certainly that kind of sense of being able to connect with others um, in different situations does seem like a really helpful approach to take. I mean, I, I want to say that there should be people in church with you you can talk to, that a church is a place to go if, if that's the kind of situation. I, I'm conscious that that might not prove helpful, um, that pastors like me get things wrong and are not always able to offer help that would be helpful but um but i want to be hopeful um that, yeah. that, that can be the case um yeah i think it's encouraging people for... to, to have the bravery to do that isn't it to to speak up and you know and it might be that going to a course with no one you know might help you have the courage to then talk to someone you do know and you can get more help because i think you know that you may need help from several different places um but for sure anyone watching this who's not going through it trying to think about how you can make sure that you know, things are set up so that people feel they can come and talk to you and that when they do, they're not going to be judged. Yeah, and I think, you know, for folks like me who are, are serving churches, like we're in a situation where we're trying to serve the people of, who are around us in the UK. You know, it's nearly 50% of people, divorce is part of their story. Um, those who are believers, it's 
there's part of a quarter of people that like, this is a real situation and i guess for those who like my church would work through books of the bible like when we work through the gospels jesus talks about this so we're going to see that when you work through books like one corinthians there's teaching there um and i guess not to be afraid of facing that and it's not that any one sermon then says everything about that yeah um but we can say something um and i think to to break the taboo and the stigma and say look jesus has things to say about this and uh and it you know it's it's risking picking at something that's painful for people uh, but there's there's also good news here and there's grace for people um and that's helpful um to to engage with um and so let's not be afraid of of doing that excellent dave is there anything you'd like to ask me that we haven't talked about um, i don't want to pry into your stories i think that's yeah that's like that great kind of thank you expect me to do but that's not my place to do um i think you've served people really well by gathering that stuff together um and uh it's the beginning of a conversation isn't it it's not not everything yeah. that can ever be said um, but to know that there's some helpful things put together there uh, um will help will help i think so no thanks for that and i think that is one of the challenges isn't it because um obviously in some ways people would you know maybe find it helpful if i was to spill my guts and tell my story and talk about what i'd experienced and go oh yeah i can recognize that but the challenge there is that it's not always appropriate and it's not really fair um to my ex-wife as well you know because obviously i'd say one my side her side might be very different and you can sound quite churlish quite quickly if you're not careful as well like oh well this is this is what happened that's what happened and look at me kind of thing so whereas i think you know obviously the writing about stigma and obviously some of that is affected by my own journey my own experience um and i've certainly had experiences of feeling some people have been unhelpful or said unhelpful things some people who wanted to be helpful and kind ended up saying things that weren't helpful but i guess that happens and i guess as christians we need to be gracious there as well you know that if someone with the best will in the world is trying to support you but they say something that is hurtful and and unkind and that certainly happened as well through through being sick so i mean i had a bit of a double whammy really i was sick and then um had this experience and so there's a lot of pain of that there's a lot of sleepless nights of tears have have happened but you know through that I would say that, you know, God has been faithful and, you know, to a certain extent I've come out the other side um, of that, moved on, and and, and I'm now happily remarried. Um, but that's not everyone's story, of course, and it's not necessary, nor should it be. Uh, in some situations, um, people may well feel, you know, once bitten, twice shy kind of thing, um, and they may, may not feel ready um, or, or able to consider remarriage. Um but it, it, I think people fall into two camps on that one, really. And, and we, as you've said earlier, we, we need to be respectful of that and not just assume that the answer is that someone should definitely get remarried, um, nor should we assume, you know, that that they should should stay single. And, and maybe looking into the reasons for that reason, because both those decisions could be made from a healthy place or actually they could be made from an unhealthy place of pain. You know, I've been let down. I'm not going to be let down again or you know, um, or I, or I'm alone now, so I'm going to rush into a, a relationship that's wholly inappropriate, and as and so, and I think yeah, trying to open up and get friends and find people that you can talk to who've been through this experience, but also people who haven't, because there are people with wise and kindly heads on them, like Dave Bish, my friend, who can talk to you and support you. So don't feel like you're on your own, and don't stay on your own. I think that would be my main advice to anyone who's who's facing this on a personal level, as I have. Um, that you know you can't get through this on your own you need help and you need support and get it from anywhere you can find it i would say yeah so my sense there from just listening to you is um i mean i guess partly the kind of the broader challenge of unmarried life people need friends um mm. and so let's not click and um think oh if i'm married i can only be with married people and so someone who's unmarried should be on the outside of that but to, to be available and be a friend is helpful um and i guess presumably within that um like where there's pain i mean this probably applies more widely doesn't it but it's it's not our place to dig up people's painful situations but that when someone feels safe to share um not to be yeah. shocked and appalled or um yes. but to be able to listen and to to just be there is is helpful um and that allows someone to speak as, as they feel able to do so.
No, I think that's right. And and sometimes you don't have to have the answers. And I think that can be one of the challenges. You know, as Christians, we like to think, you know, we've got the solution. And of course, in one sense, we do. We know Jesus, we've got the gospel. The gospel is the answer to everything. But actually, you know, you can have an unfixable problem, you know, and you can have a situation that seems impossible and it's an incredibly painful, hurtful situation. And one of the worst things that you can do in that situation, whatever it is, actually, um, as a well-meaning Christian or a well-meaning pastor, is wade in with your size 10s and go, I, I know just what you need to do. If you just do this, everything will be all right. Um, and, and that can be incredibly unhelpful, actually. And we just have to be comfortable sometimes with sitting with people, a bit like Job's friends did. I mean, Job's friends were great for the first however long as they sat with him in his pain. Uh, it was when they opened their mouths that they that they became less helpful. And I think, you know, sometimes we do well to just listen and just be there for someone. Yeah. Sounds good. Would you pray for us, Dave, as we finish? Yeah, let's go. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you that you're full of grace uh, for us. That in the Lord Jesus, you've uh, provided uh, a pathway to life, uh, to goodness for us beyond what we could deserve. Uh, you've given us a promise that that one day all things will be made new, um, that there will be something far more than anything we know in the here and now. Um, there'll be the ultimate marriage of Christ and his church. Um, and we long for that, but we're not there yet. Uh, and so as we live in the here and now, um, give us wisdom, give us care for one another, help us in our broken situations uh, where not all things can be mended in the here and now. Uh, to to take time with each other, to love well, to care well, to understand well, uh, to sit and listen, as we've just said. And um, yeah, Father, please help us not to hide uh, behind st taboos or put those sort of stigma things in the way of being able to talk about stuff, but that we might be people who can appropriately talk about anything um, and uh, and walk through. Uh, wherever we find ourselves, whatever has been going on, um, and find your grace and your goodness in that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dave. Lovely to chat. Okay, and um, see you somewhere in cyberspace. Yeah, we'll do. All right. God bless. <laughs>